Hi everyone, welcome back to the next episode of Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. Greg is remote today and when we switch over to him, you'll see that he's wearing one of my uncle's shirts from Hawaii that is just a way to kind of remember my uncle. This last week I was able to be on the island of Kauai. Um, he passed away and so we were just spending some time with his family and having the funeral services. And my uncle was an avid collector of these Hawaiian shirts. So we took a few back with us and those will be shirts that we can remember him by. Um, I am so excited to talk with you today and share with you my friend, Emily Freeman. And um, we are just gonna go through some of her life and look at um, some of the work that she and I have been doing together and some of the work that she does without me. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so great. Welcome. Do you? Yeah, um, I'm guessing that you guys can see me and uh, in dedicate we dedicate this podcast uh, to Uncle Bill and I'm wearing one of his shirts. It's, uh, I don't know if you can totally see it or not, but I hope you can. So it's great to have you, Emily. Uh, we are very excited to have you on Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. And uh, this this podcast has been dedicated to helping people come together from various backgrounds to have a conversation that is both convicted and civil and helping people understand that you can do that in a myriad of areas, not just religious discussion, but in politics and economic issues and uh, all the things that divide us. The greatest uh, tool that we have is is to uh, is is to really follow this example of conviction and yet civility. And so uh, thanks for being on our program and being an example of that. Well, thanks for having me. We'd love to okay. just start out a little bit with your background and um, how you got from point A to B and um, just tell us a little bit about your family and, and what you do. So I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Actually, my dad was going to Harvard when I was born. And then we moved to Utah. That's where my dad worked his whole life. I am the oldest of six children and I was born into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints faith tradition. That's what my parents belonged to when I was born and raised up in that faith tradition. When I was a senior in high school, my dad actually got called to be a mission president, which is a calling within our church where you serve for three years, somewhere not where you live and um, preach the gospel. So we moved to Ventura, California, my senior year, and uh, did a lot of missionary work, proselyting, and then I came home before my parents did and was married and went to college while they finished out that mission. And then everybody moved back here to Utah. And I have five kids of my own now. I am a, an author, I love to write, I do a lot of speaking all across the country and actually the world. My favorite thing to talk about is Jesus. So that's what I write about. That's what I talk about. Um, I love interfaith work. So a lot of what I do has to do with meeting people where they are and finding the similarities in that place. That's really cool. Um, one of the things that I remember you telling me about is kind of how you initially got started with interfaith. Has that some, been something that you've always loved or was it um, a, from this time when your publisher had the conversation with you about broadening your audience? So I was raised, my parents' parents, so my grandparents, um, all came into the church at different times into religion even at different times. And so when I grew up, it was very common for us to have members of different faiths in our home. And then when we went to California and served that mission, I had so many friends who were different religions. I dated a Jewish boy. A lot of my friends were Christian. Um, in the high school there, there actually were only five members of my faith in oh, the wow. high school. So the majority of my friends were of other religions. And I love and have always loved learning about Jesus and talking about Jesus. So during the years I was there, those conversations were um, with a lot of different faith traditions, um, especially the 
boy who I dated who was Jewish talking about um, God and, and what our religions both looked like was something that I just really enjoyed. And then several years ago, and now I, I want to think it's probably been almost 10, which is crazy, but it feels like just barely, the publisher that I work with um, talked to me about some of what I love to write. And I love the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I love telling the stories from those books. So my publisher said, why don't you try writing something for the national Christian market and just see how it does, but you need to learn the vocabulary and you need to have an understanding of what that looks like. And that was a really educational time for me because as I started diving in, I had been a fan already of Ann Voskamp. And um, when I was like 18 or 19, I read the um, Left Behind series. Mm -hmm. And so I, I lived a little bit in that world, but not where I felt like I had a really great command of the vocabulary. So I signed up for a Bible study that was 20 minutes from my house. And I did that Bible study for three years. Every Wednesday, I would go and meet with these Christian women. And the church was so kind to let me come in as a, a Latter-day Saint. I was the only one in the group who was not a Christian, uh, traditional Christian and to allow me to have a voice there and to be able to learn and talk with them. And what I loved the most is finding what was similar hmm. between us. So then I started doing writing and had the opportunity to make some really great friendships and connections that I still look to today. That's beautiful. I, I love, Greg, you and I have talked about the differences of vocabulary between the two different faith communities and how you really have to learn when I say the word grace, does that mean the same thing to you? you yes. know, or and charity and the atonement. And there's some words that are so familiar in our vocabulary. Someone, um, in, in any conversation, they're going to come up but they don't necessarily translate the same. Sacraments are mm -hmm. the same. Covenants are the same. There's just some words that when we talk, I started learning. It's so important to say, okay, this is what I call sacrament. What do you call sacrament? This is how we express a belief in the atonement of Jesus Christ. What words do you use mm. for that? And, and charity was one for me that we use charity all the time. And the longer I was in that Bible study, I realized um, it's more common for you to use the word love hmm. or pure love. And you tell me if I'm not right there, but I, I just learned it becomes so helpful to, to say, this is what I'm talking about. Is this the same word you would use yeah. in this conversation? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just want to chime in here because I think in my own experience, uh, both, uh, with work that you know I'm familiar that I know you're familiar with that I've done with Robert Millet from BYU and lots of conversations and dialogues with scholars and uh, general authorities and leaders um, and and what we just did Emily I don't know if you realize uh, that we work with college students as well so over the last three weeks we've had university students from Biola University Westmont College uh, Duluth Minnesota uh, Mobile Alabama and we get to bring them to the institutes and to BYU and these kids sit together for literally two to three hours and uh, and you have to kind of pry them apart after two or three hours. And yeah. you think, well, Gen Z can't concentrate on anything. Well, they can. Uh, and, and I have proof of it because I've seen them not not just this year or last year, but over the last 20 years, we've seen students literally thrive in these circles of four to six to eight kids talking about what do you mean by this and what do you mean by that? And it, we just did it again, and we were just blown away again by the incredible positivity and the, the appreciation and the affection and love for one another. But it always comes back to this vocabulary thing. And I think sometimes our evangelical community is suspicious. Mm. Like if the Latter-day Saint says, I believe in grace, the immediate response is, no, you don't. <laughs> or, you know, if I, if I worship Jesus Christ, oh, no, you don't. And, and our community, I think, really has to get over that. And I'm going to probably take some hits for that because what I think is really valuable, what you just did is you say, uh, rather than say, no, you don't, it's like, oh, that's wonderful. 
can can we talk about that? Can can you explain what you mean by that? Can you can we have a conversation about grace? Can we have a conversation about works? The, how do they fit together? What do they do differently? And are they both appropriate for a Christian's life? And and I just we've been able to do that for the twenty years with students. Um, but I just I, I do you think the LDS community? Uh, you know, I'm going to ask you because you are our guest today. A lot of times evangelicals will say, oh, they're just using our words, but they mean something different than they and they have some ulterior agenda, you know, and I don't, I, I think the best way to un, unpack that again is just to ask the question, hey, ex explain to me what you're saying. But uh, as a Latter-day Saint, do you think more and more uh, Latter-day Saints are using traditional Christian terminology? One, and then two, if they are, why are they? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think part of what I would say is there are certain words that fill our vocabulary that are um, Bible-driven words. They're words that come from those words that were written thousands of years ago. And I think for, for both of us, those words would be really similar. Um, we, we tend to lean into the King James version of mm. the Bible translation. And so a lot of the words we choose to use that would be religious words will come out of that text. Um, what makes it tricky is because we have other scripture that we also lean into, there will be words from those scriptures that are more modern words is what I would say, which have also become part of our vocabulary. And I think that's where things get a little bit um, tricky because you'll hear us using some of those familiar biblical terms, but also um, having some more modern terms that we would use to define what we think faith looks like. And that's where I think it, you see that overlap a little bit of what we're talking about here might not necessarily be that what was used 2,000 years ago, you know, or 4,000 years ago to describe faith. But, but, and, and, and that's helpful, but I kind of want to speak to my evangelical community here and, and just kind of follow up by saying there, there wasn't a memo that was passed out by the brethren of the LDS church or the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that said, start using these kind of traditional Christian terms so you can trick all our evangelical <laughs> friends yes, into thinking no. that we're fellow believers. Yeah, no, that is not true. And I think, um, I'm trying to think of words that would be new in our realm. I do know in the past decade, the word we talk about that is atonement, the word that you would use would be grace. And um, as, as um, I don't even know why, but in recent years, we've started trying to not use the word atonement as much as the word Jesus and grace, not as much because of what a traditional Christian would say, but because we're trying to remember, and I love what President Russell M. Nelson taught us, we don't want to talk about an event. And for us, the atonement would be Gethsemane, the cross, and the resurrection all combined, like the, the fullness of Jesus Christ's sacrifice um, is what we would term the atonement. But it's not the atonement that heals us or saves us or delivers us or transforms us or helps us to become. That's Jesus who does that. And if you want to say through grace or what would be more common in a Latter-day Saint vocabulary is through the power of the atonement would be a, a more common phrase for a Latter-day Saint. Those would both be similar words. And I think 80% of people would say through the power of the atonement. But I think grace is becoming a more familiar term for us because more people are speaking about it. And... So I, I think you might would see a transition there in this upcoming generation. Well, there are a lot of key LDS writers right now that are writing about grace. Do you know anybody that has written about grace from the LDS community? <laughs> yeah, so, so Bob Millett and Brad Wilcox and I are oh, really yeah, passionate. <laughs> yeah, there's three of us who are really passionate about bringing that word grace back into our daily vocabulary. So that is true. And it's 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 a book that 
has sold well. I mean, it's been very much featured by Deseret Book. And and I think when people like yourself and Bob and Brad and others uh, talk about grace and are comfortable using that word and give explanation to it, um, then I think a lot of other people who may have felt it was, oh, well, grace is their word, you know, but we talk about works because as a LDS youth, I did. I, I thought that our church was teaching us in my teen years that we we showed Heavenly Father that we were worthy, that we made, you know, we were serious uh, about our faith and we we chose the right and we we did all these things. And so when people would talk about grace, we would immediately assume it was cheap. It was frivolous. Uh, you know, it wasn't it. You know, he was just taking advantage of God. But we were more serious Christians. And uh, but I think, you know, this conversation, for example, helps evangelicals to understand that LDS people are comfortable with grace and with the term grace more and more, but you have to give them an opportunity to explain that, you yeah. know, because if they use atonement or if they use grace interchangeably, even uh, there, there's just some history there. And again, it, it's just the most basic principle of good dialogue is to ask questions, sincere, honest questions that are not, you know, with an agenda or to try to corner you or to try to put somebody in an awkward position, but to just say, hey, I don't understand that. Can you help me understand what you mean when you say whatever you just said? You know? Yeah. And I love that idea because I think for so long we've battled against this grace and works discussion, which actually isn't even the right battle because I think for, for us, grace, the word we would substitute for that is the power of the atonement. That would be a good substitution there. And works, I'm trying to think what a word would be that you would use for works besides works. And, and I want to say faith would be my guess. What, what we use to describe works would probably be a word you use to describe faith, maybe. I'm trying to think what, what is, is the I word that I describes think. the actions of belief for you? I think Disci we would use Disci service. Disci Discipleship. Oh, discipleship. discipleship would be really good. Yeah. But also, I think service, because um, when we think about works, we're thinking we're doing things in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think the confusion comes because there's been this feeling that LDS sometimes look at works as um, we're doing this to gain something. And that comes from your scripture that, that says, after all we can do. Well, and actually that after all we can do is confusing because if you read that in second Nephi, um, and you go to Nephi as the expert, Nephi will tell you nine times in that chapter, all you can do is believe in Jesus. That's what I he tells that. you, love that. which I think would make us very similar. That yes. all you can do is believe in Christ. That's what Nephi says. He says it nine times if you go through that chapter. And so I think in that regard, we would be the same. But I like what you're talking about with service and discipleship, both. That's a really good connect for me because I think what works becomes for us is what Jesus calls us into as a disciple and that really does become service to god and service to people that for me that seems like what discipleship would become and that would be works for us mm -hmm. that's what we would call works and i think in both camps both lds and traditional christians we can run into um, situations where we are doing things for other people that are not necessarily under the power of the Holy Spirit, where I'm doing this to get affirmation or I'm doing this so that people look at me good. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of blurs the line sometimes in both camps yeah. where we need to be um, resting on our salvation in Christ alone and then letting the Holy Spirit work in us and, and use our giftings to help other people and to serve other people. And to become like him, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what we're trying. We are trying to become for others what he would be. If he and the only way there. that we can do that is with Christ. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I love that. And, and Emily, what, what is the title of your book, just in case anybody would want to So I actually have two now because I have one that just released a week ago. So the first one is called Grace Where You Are. And the second one is called Grace to Become. 
So um, what I'm teaching there is in the first book, it just talks about the truth that Jesus will meet you where you are as you are. That is grace. We see that over and over again, particularly in New Testament stories. It comes alive for us because we can watch him engaging there where, um, you know, we believe that he came down into a stable, into a dirty and messy situation, right? He came down to where we are as we are. And you can even take that more, like you think of the woman caught in adultery, you know, when they bring her in, in that temple courtyard. And there's nothing there where Jesus says to her, what was your all you could do? in this mm, moment. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what was your after all you could do? That does not happen there. Um, she, she was caught in the very act, right? She was caught in the very act, it tells us. And I love that Jesus met her where she was as she was. And what does he bring into her story? Grace. That's mm. what he brings. He, he's going to heal and deliver and rescue and save. That's what's going to happen. Um, that's what I love to call saving grace. That's what you call it too. But I also see examples of not just a grace that helps us overcome sin and death and wounds, but there is also a part of grace that helps us become, that elevates us. Um, I, I think the same way there was a condescension when Jesus came down, there was an ascension right? Mm -hmm. At the end of all the gospels, we read about an ascension. And do you remember when Jesus says, um, I will be lifted up that I will draw all men unto me. There is something else about grace that says he will lift us up to where he is as he is, right? There's there's a grace to become Mm -hmm. that we also engage in. And I think for me, that saving grace that is done. That happened on the cross. That we all can lean into that saving grace. And and if we believe in Christ can be saved is how I would describe that. I think, um, within the Christian faith, you might, um, describe that different from a Latter-day Saint perspective, but that is what I would tell you. I believe about saving grace, but I don't feel like it ends there for me because now I want to engage in a grace to become. I want him to transform me. I want him to lift me up. I, I want to become more in him. And there is a grace that expands capacity and that helps us to grow in him, that helps us to serve better than we could on our own, that helps us disciple um, and walk that path better than we could on our own. Also grace but a grace that elevates, a, a grace that transforms us. And, and for me, that, that happens as we actually walk the path of discipleship. I really love that because really it keeps us in a humble place. Yep. It keeps us in a place of realizing I can't become more like Christ without him, without yes. his grace. Yes, That's beautiful. Now, and, and I would interject, it, you, as you were discussing you know, your previous book and your new book the title, you know, I, I went back in my own memory to the very first two sermons I preached at Washington Heights Baptist Church back in 1992, almost 30 years ago, when I was a brand new young pastor. And I, I kind of really thought through the titles of my first two series, of my t- two sermons. It was a two-part series. And I wanted to be a challenging, but I also wanted to, to kind of focus on that which I thought as a young pastor would be the most theologically important topic for me to consider. So sermon number one was saved by grace alone. And then the next week was saved by works. And and I wanted to be controversial in that sense to, to as a Baptist minister, as a young pastor, to say, wait a minute, you, you, you said it right last week, but you didn't <laughs> say it right this week. You know, you, you contradicted yourself. And the point is, is there is a grace that saves and there is a grace that empowers and really rises us up, according to the Apostle Paul, who's the guy who talks about grace every time, yeah. um, that we become new creatures. We become new individuals, new people in our relationship with God, so that it's not us trying to be more like Jesus in our own human flesh, in our own best effort, which is so, 
you know, Paul says, I, I, I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. But one thing I do is I press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So I think that, you know, your vocabulary and our definitional conversation about this is helping me feel very comfortable with your understanding that grace is a saving power. It saves us from our sins. I mean, it, to, to take your own story uh, from the Bible, you know, he says first to this woman caught in adultery, which was all to trap Jesus in an awkward position and to try to get him to mess up uh, as the Pharisees brought her, but not him, you know, to, cause he was, there was, there always takes two to commit adultery. And uh, uh, so she was brought and he says, I don't condemn you. That's grace that, that blesses you and, and forgives you and brings you into righteousness and declares. I mean, she didn't do anything for him to say. She didn't even apologize. She, he just said, neither do I condemn you. Where did your accusers go? They've left. Neither do I condemn you. But then he said, go and sin no more. Yeah. And so there's something that Jesus gives us, not just to, um, uh, to, to be saved, but to live for him. And I want to, I want to be humble in my understanding of God's word to say, I didn't, I didn't do anything to get saved, but Jesus saved me. And I don't do anything to earn my salvation, but Jesus, if he's real in my life, he will give me the heart, the desire, the passion, and yes, even the ability to be more considerate, to be more loving, to change my heart, to, to, to reject violence and, and anger and, and pride and to start really you know, changing my character. If those are issues in your life, the things that are old should begin to pass away and the new should start emerging, this new character, this new heart, this new love, this new ability. So I, I, it's not that we're, you know, kind of saved for a little part of us and then we have to earn the rest. It's not the God of the gaps as Bob Millett likes to talk about. No, he saves us completely and he empowers us completely. But that is, like, and, and just, just use the last example from John 15, when Jesus says, you know, if you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. An apple tree doesn't have to try to bear apples. It just does. And a Christian doesn't have to do good work. They just should because it's Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in you. Yeah, I love that so much. I was reading about this um, in this Amish book. I don't know if you've ever been to Amish country before, but I love going there. And there is something about their simple way of life that just calls to me. Mm. And so I, I tend to read a lot about what they do and, and what they're thinking. And it's so interesting because there is this one quote where the person talks about, you don't become what we are by living like we live. Hmm. We mm -hmm. live like we live because of what we are. And I was hmm. like, that is so good. And that is so true about being a Christian, right? That we live the way we live because we have taken Christ's name mm -hmm. upon us. That's why we live like that. And, and that's, that's the walk of our life. The, the deeper we love him, the deeper we walk that path, I feel like. I love that. The other Bible story that came to my mind was um, when we're talking about grace is the thief on the cross mm -hmm. because obviously he, he doesn't have time to, to walk this walk and to become more like Christ, but he just professes faith. Yeah, I love, um, I have a good friend who was blind, and in fact, when we went out to dinner, you'll remember just right before the pandemic started, I, I ended up having to leave early to go and sit with her, and she ended up passing away the next day. And right. her and I were, um, we had been, friends for, I don't, since we were 16 years old. Wow. So this was like a deep friendship. And she was one of my favorite to talk about scripture with. And we would, I would sit on the end of her bed and we would talk about these stories. And the year that I was writing that first grace book, I kept saying to her, let's think of everywhere we can think of where Jesus meets someone where they are as they are. Let's think of everywhere we can go. Um, in scripture and find that. And so when we would get together, we both would report on what we had seen recently. And it was right before she died, probably the week before that dinner that we had. Um, I went over to her house and sat on her bed and I said to her, I found the best one. In all of scripture, it, this is the best one. And she said, what is it? 
And I said to her, it's the thief on the cross. Jesus met him where he was as he was. Hmm. He met him there. And it was so cute. She just gasped when I said it. And we both just thought about that. Like there is nowhere he will not go Mm -hmm. to meet you in that place, even on the cross. That's what we realized there. And, and I love that that's so beautiful because I think in order to understand grace, we first have to be won by that thought that he, it doesn't matter where you are in your story. It doesn't matter what is going on in your life. It, It does not matter all the terrible things you have done. Jesus will meet you where you are, as you are. There is not a story in scripture that doesn't teach that beautifully. Yeah, that, that is absolutely awesome. I, I confirm that. I, I, I absolutely support and embrace what you're saying. It's, it is at the heart of this message that there's a sinful world full of sinful people. And what we try to do is compare ourselves to one another a lot of times. Well, I'm not as bad as that person over mm-hmm. there. Or have you seen her? She, you know, she's got real problems. And we compare ourselves. And there's this old illustration that people will sometimes use that if you had to jump the chasm of the Grand Canyon uh, to, to, to get away from a fire and survive, um, 10 out of 10 people are going to die because they can't jump the chasm of the <clears throat> of the entire width of the Grand Canyon. Now, some might be able to jump 10 feet. Some might only be able to jump two feet. But the end result is the same for all because no matter how athletic you are to jump across a, a cavern, however far you can go, nobody, nobody can meet the standard of perfection, the, the standard of complete holiness. And that that's such a great word. And I think Latter-day Saints love the word holy and mm-hmm. we love the word holy. And it literally means other, that, that there's something that is holy, it's other than normal. It's the normal is not holy. And there's something other about holiness that it's, it's like not of us, but it's something we encounter and it has weight and it has impact. And it, it's, it's a standard of righteousness that God himself possesses and will not, according to scripture, he can't even be present mm. in sin. So how can he love us when we are filled with sin? He loves us through this grace gift, which makes us righteous. And now we are not his enemy anymore. Now we are not his, you know, trying to prove ourselves all the time kind of people. We are we are made righteous and we call that justification. But then we begin to take the walk, the walk of discipleship, the walk of obedience, the, the walk of sanctification to become more and more like Jesus every day. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, again, I, as often as I've heard Jill talk about your conversations, I just I just appreciate you so much and the role you're taking in your own faith community to to lift up the idea and the understanding of grace. Um, So just thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I love just as we maybe finish up this part on grace and as you talk about that Grand Canyon chasm there, um, there's another example that I love that I think would play in well for both of us. Um, A man named Charles Blondin. I don't know if you know who that is, but he would walk the tightrope across from Niagara from the United States side over to the Canada side. And he was really good at it. People told him it could not be done. They tied the rope up the first time and and they were like, because of the wind, because of the mist that will get on the rope, because of all these things, it cannot be done. And yet he did it. He he was able to figure out, and, and he didn't just do it, but he did it a million different ways. He one time went over with a garbage or a potato sack over his head. One time Mm. he took one of those old fashioned cameras, got to the middle, turned around, took a picture of the people on the other side and then crossed over to the other. He made an omelet in the middle of the rope one time. (laughs) And then he one time came across on a wheelbarrow and said to the people, who do you think is the best tightrope walker in the world? And they were like, it's you. And um, do you believe that? He asked him. And yes, they all cried out, the whole crowd. And he said to them, then who will get in the wheelbarrow? And no one wanted to. Well, it was years after that that his manager said he would ride piggyback on Blondin's back across that rope. And what they would do is they would lay that rope out, and then they would tie it to the edges with um, guy lines is what they call them 
to try and make it more steady for him. But in the middle, there was 50 feet they could not use any guy lines to attach to. And so he put his Harry on his back, and he started walking across, and he got to the middle, and he said to him, from this point forward, you are me. Don't lean one way or another way. Don't look one way or another way. Whatever I do, you do. If you do not, we will both go to our death. And they made it all the way across to the other side. Only one guy line broke. Other than that, they made it. And I think that might be one of the most beautiful descriptors of grace I've ever heard because how did Harry get to the other side? He, he couldn't do anything. He didn't walk at all, right? Charles carried him to the other side. What Harry's responsibility, though, was to hold on with all of his heart, might, mind, and strength. That was Harry's job, right? Charles did all the work. He, he's the one who got them both over there. And sometimes when I think about grace, I always have to say to myself, I'm just holding on to Jesus. That's what I have to do with all of my heart, my mind, and strength and believe that he's able to take me to a place that I could never get to on my own. I, I'm not capable of getting to that place on my own but he's capable. And as long as I can become him, right? Just lean into me. Don't balance your own way. Just hold on and I'm going to get you there. And I love what that teaches about that walk of a disciple, right? Yeah. Now let me just do a a quick question or a a concern that could emerge. And I just want to know how you respond, because as you're saying that Harry, his, his uh, manager or whatever had to lean into Jesus. I mean, lean into the, the tightrope walker himself uh, and could not accomplish that on his own. um, One might suggest that he, he did, he did his part because he, he leaned in and held on and, and, and moved just appropriately. So in what you discussed, I was very comfortable, but, you know, I could just see somebody patting themselves on the back and saying, did you see how well I leaned into uh, the <laughs> walker? Did you, see, did you see how I moved exactly with him? Yeah. And I just stayed, I mean, I was impressive, wasn't I? And if you were to kind of go there, there's not anybody in the room that would say yes. They would say, are you crazy? He did everything and you did nothing. Yes, holding on to him was something, but but as a Christian, we we would feel comfortable saying, hold on to Jesus. Uh, let him guide you. Let him lead you. Yeah. Let him uh, strengthen yeah. you. Find, find um, your balance in him. You know, that, and I think that's important is, I think it's important to remember whose feet are on the tightrope. Um, and I yeah. think that's what we forget sometimes. And, and that um, walk of a disciple for me is so well described in Harry just holding on. You know, just hold on to Christ, believe in Christ, lean into Christ. And that's how we're going to get to the place we couldn't get on our own. Do you ever find that like some traditional Christians look at you and and hear these things that you're saying and and they find it hard to believe that as a Latter-day Saint that you believe some of these things? And I think what makes it hard is... Um, the, the first thing that I always want to say to people is we have to remember our belief stems from a similar book of scripture, right? As a Latter-day Saint, I believe in the Old Testament and I believe in the New Testament. So whatever is taught about grace or um, repentance or forgiveness or love, whatever stems from there, I am going to find truth in that. that there is nothing in our in those scriptures old testament or new testament that someone in our religion would say well that's not true because um there's nothing in there anything that is in there is going to be a foundation of my belief but the question is um how well do we have an understanding of that foundation mm. of our belief mm-hmm. yeah 
Hey, I'd love to start getting into what you and I have been doing together. And um, can I can I just ask, yep. can I just ask one last question and then then I think it'd be <laughs> yes because because um, you know in in each of our traditions there are different voices and there's old school and there's new school and there's those that are kind of more structured or or kind of uh, with our visiting students we went to the last uh, three BYU devotionals and. Um, one of them, I, I don't want to reference the name or, or the individual, but um, the talk really did seem to our evangelical students to really almost kind of point to perfectionism, a kind of, you know, do your best all the time. And, and if you don't, you know, there's, you can be forgiven, but, you know, get right back on that, on that ladder and keep climbing, you know, and, and if you fall off, well, that's okay. You can be forgiven, but get back on that. So there's a, there was a real feeling in his, in his message that, that came off um, very perfectionistic. Would you say that there is, is that a thought that you, you know, see in the LDS community that you're, you know, would, would like to see kind of go away? Or is there a way as an LDS person that I can understand that that doesn't seem so different than the way you're speaking? Um, okay. So I think the one thing that um, where we would have to begin is going back to this idea of discipleship. That's, that's going to be where something like that would stem from. And how does discipleship actually play into what it looks like to live out faith? Um, so when you think about like sanctification, which I would define as... Um, mm -hmm being made set apart through the way that you live your life. I like um, Joshua uses it. And if you study his word sanctification, it will talk about being made holy through ritual behavior, right? There's, there is something about sanctification that is almost practicing holiness might be a, a good way of describing that. Would that be true? Um, it, I don't know what a good definition for sanctification would be for you. Uh, a lot of a lot of traditional Christians would simply say becoming more and more like Jesus, uh, taking on His characteristics, taking on His His character, and and be living living our life in a way that more and more reflects and honors uh, His will for our life. Okay, so uh, th that'd be very similar for us. And so, what you are calling uh, perfectionism would be more a talk themed by sanctification is is what that would feel like for us. When we would hear a talk like that, that would be less about salvation and more about sanctification for us. It would be more about becoming and less about saving. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, it does sound different than when I listen to you. It, it just seems like the way you use justification and sanctification is very biblical. I mean, and I think it's very... Uh, Book of Mormon as well, because yes. I think, you know, I'm familiar enough with the redemptive theology of the Book of Mormon. And uh, truly, if traditional Christians just sat and read the Book of Mormon, they would be frankly inspired <laughs> by a lot of the redemptive uh, so examples true. of it. Yes. I think sometimes where it gets confusing, we we did sit in on a, a meeting with someone in these, um, with the students that we're talking about. And the students were able to ask a lot of questions. And some of the questions came up with um, the different levels of heaven. Mm. And so there, it was confusing between, you know, when I'm saved by grace alone, yeah. through Christ alone, does that just get me into the lowest level? And right. then if I do these things, so, then I can get to the highest level and be in the presence of the Heavenly Father. Yeah. Okay, so this is a really good question. And and grace and works would be less of a um, conversation starter compared to what Jill just said. And I think this might be the rub. This may be the rub, even within my own faith tradition, because this is the part that, that um, becomes key to understanding what discipleship and becoming looks like for us, as opposed to um, saving and healing. Does that make sense? So okay. let me first say what I understand about a Christian belief system to make sure I'm right. And then I will explain to you a Latter-day Saint belief system. So from what I understand from a Christian belief system is you just have heaven and hell. There's two places. 
If you believe in Jesus is how I would describe it, but I think you would use a, a word like confess or... Uh, or put our faith in Christ to save us. Yes. Put your faith in Christ to save you. You would go to heaven. And everyone who doesn't choose that would go to hell. And this is why our conversations get tricky. This is the part where it gets really tricky is because of like what our life looks like here is actually very similar. The way we live out religion, I feel like is similar between us. Where it gets tricky is the next place we go. So for example, I went to lunch with all Christian, traditional Christian women. I was the only Latter-day Saint who was at the lunch. And when we got there, one of the women was asking me um, a little bit about my faith. And then she said, you know that in our faith tradition, someone from your faith won't go to heaven. And a lot of people tell me that. So I was not offended. I was like, I know, I know that um, that's where like our beliefs don't match up is the fact that I, I wouldn't get into heaven in the way you view heaven, whereas you would. And we ended up sitting at lunch for an hour and a half and, and we got along so well and had this beautiful conversation. And at the very end, she said to me, I don't know how it's going to work. But I do know God will make a place in heaven for you. Mm. And it was a really great lesson for me to realize we actually don't really know how it's going to work, but there are things we know inside that, like, it was so kind of her to be like, somehow I think there will be a place for you in heaven. And um, I think that is more true than we realize. So if you take your heaven and hell, I'm just going to really simply explain to you what ours looks like. So in our belief, there actually isn't a hell. There is a place you can go that does not have Jesus or the spirit or faith or any of those places. And you would choose to go there. Like you, you would deny Christ. You would deny the Holy Ghost. You just would be like, I don't want any of that in my afterlife. And that would be a choice you would make. So uh, that's what we would call hell, although we call it outer darkness. That's just the name we use for that. Then what our heaven looks like is, um, um, you know when you read in Corinthians and it talks about the celestial and the terrestrial. Um, I talked to my friend Nish about this, so you guys chime in and tell me. But when I talked to Nish about it, I was like, tell me what like that means for you, because that helps me. And she said, when we look at that, we look at it as a way of living now. Um, that, that you would choose to, how much light or how much brightness you would want in your life it is a way of living. Would that be a good descriptor for that for you? That, that's how she likes to read into it. No, uh, my own my own study of that passage historically and understanding the context of the Greek mind, which Paul is writing in Corinth, you know, is that in the Greek world, there were three heavens mm. and the highest heaven is where the gods lived. That was like Olympus. That was where the gods lived. So the celestial was the place where the gods lived. Okay. And then there were two other heavens in their mind. There was the outer atmosphere of the globe, like the sun and the moon and the stars. That would be the second heaven. And then the T lesser would be the air and the atmosphere around the earth. So in the Greek mind, when you hear first heaven or highest heaven, or, you know, you're thinking that's where God lives. And then if you think low heaven, you think that's earth and the, the air and the atmosphere around you. Now that's a pretty standard, you know, well-defined historical understanding in all Bible commentaries that you would read from Bible scholars that, that the Greek mind considered that there were three heavens, but they weren't three degrees of spiritual glory. They were the, the, the God level, the, the, the universe level, and then the air level. So that, okay, that's, so that's I wouldn't and, see it that way. And sometimes when I, with that in mind, sometimes when I describe what I think heaven looks at like, it looks like different degrees of relationship. So you, you see it here too, in, in the world we live in right now, where there, one degree of relationship, maybe someone who's like, I, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in 
uh, Jesus dying on the cross. I don't believe in, in any of these things, but I'm still a good person. I, I still have moral value within everything that I'm doing. I'm, I'm not, um, you know, a murderer or uh, whatever. I, I bring value to where I live. And, and in our time, we have people like that too, who just have chosen no religion, no God at all, but they still are bringing beautiful contributions into the world. And then we might have some people who we would say, um, I don't know what you call them, but the Sunday Christian or the, they do church every single week, but um, in the middle of the week, you know, just depending on what's going on is which of the tenants they might adhere to. And then maybe the other would be someone who is actively pursuing discipleship would be the other. And when I look at this conversation and where this rub is that you're talking about, like where you heard that talk or the other, I think it's important to remember that for us, this is what heaven is. First of all, you are saved by Christ. As long as you believe in him, that's all you can do is believe in him, you get to go to heaven. Okay, you just get to go. Now, is that just a basic, like, I believe in the historical uh, Jesus, or is that more of a, I believe that he died for my sins? Yes, I believe that he okay. died for my sins. That is what it would be. I believe in uh, the cross, the resurrection, uh, that I believe through, by, maybe you would say like this, I believe by virtue of the cross, I can overcome death and sin. Okay. Okay, that in and of itself gets me to heaven. That is grace to overcome. Okay, and, and we, the, in the Latter-day Saint tradition, we believe that unless you outright deny the spirit and deny Christ, you will come to heaven. So like I, when I was at lunch with that lady, I laughed because I'm like, it's so funny because our belief system for some reason is kinder because I think all of you are going to be in heaven with me. That would be my belief. I don't think there's anyone I know who will not come to heaven. Um, so in our mind, heaven is, is that big um, because you would have to literally deny the Holy Ghost and deny Christ to not come. Um, however, then there's going to be, so the grace to overcome, right? That's going to be death and sin. The grace to become, the grace that elevates, the grace that transforms, the, what allows you to walk the disciples' path, in our mind, just like it does here, will transition to heaven. There will be some people who are like, I don't need God or scripture, but I can still contribute goodness. And I will accept, I will, this is what we say, that person would pay for their own sins. But when they were done paying for their own sins, they would have to bow their knee to Christ and acknowledge that he exists. And then they could come in if they wanted to. They don't have to, but if they wanted to, they could. Um, but then we have the other that is like, how much do you want to engage in relationship with Christ? Then how you learn to walk in that relationship, the degree of that relationship you want to enter into will actually affect what he your heaven experience will be like. And if, if the degree of your relationship is, I want all that the Father has, then your heaven will be all that the Father has. If you don't want all that the Father has, then there are other degrees in heaven that, that will be maybe more comfortable for you, is how we would say it. And so in our mind, how does heaven become comfortable? By actually living it out on earth. That, that's maybe how we would describe it. So like for me, I would say that unless I'm in the presence of the heavenly Father, that's not heaven for me. And when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me, then the way I see that is that as a believer in Christ, that I would be in the presence of Heavenly Father. So are you saying the same thing, that because 
I believe and trust in Christ, and I'm going through Christ alone, that I would be in the presence of the Heavenly Father. Right. So now this is where it's going to become a little bit different. So this will be a, a really good example of what sets us apart. For us, salvation requires belief in Christ, same as you. And it really is the same. Like, I can't think of anywhere where it is not an exact match for salvation. Um, We like to call the highest degree of heaven exaltation. And what we believe in our faith tradition is that um, ordinances and covenants will prepare you to enter into exaltation, which is all that the Father has. So... For salvation to get into heaven, believe in Jesus Christ by virtue of the cross, you will be saved. You you will overcome sin and death through him. For the highest level, the fullness, all that the Father has, there are ordinances and covenants that, that prepare me for that. So like some of those that would feel familiar are baptism. That would be... Um, one of the things that opens up the door for me to enter into a deeper degree of relationship. Um, Another one that would be familiar to all of us is sacraments. Um, So we call it the sacrament every Sunday when you take bread and water, you would call it communion sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know there are some people who call it sacrament, but communion, that is an ordinance for us. That's something that is calling us into deeper relationship with Christ. Um, And traditional traditional Christians would call that sacrament as well. Um, The Catholic Church has seven basic sacraments, and traditional Protestantism just would would kind of stand behind baptism and communion or the Lord's Supper um, that we do in remembrance of him. But again, those things wouldn't get us to the highest degree of heaven. They would just be the, the... the the expression of a sincere Christian who would follow the Lord in baptism, who would remember him with some regularity with other believers by taking the juice and the and the bread. Uh, but they would not be things that would help us get to a higher place. Right. And and I wouldn't say get to a higher place would be the right vocabulary. I it's it's probably better to say obtain deeper relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, that would that would be a better way of expressing because I think we do get confused because when we draw it out, we're going to use circles and arrows and whatever. But in reality, what you are describing is deeper relationship. And um, in the end, if you want all that the Father has, then you would give all that you are for all that the Father has. That's... That's what we are hoping for in the end. Now, am I going to be perfect at that? No, I'm terrible at it. Um, Sometimes I'm better than others, right? When I take the sacrament in my church, I make a promise um, that I will try to keep his commandments, uh, that I will take his name upon me, that I will always remember him. And the promise that I am given, that covenant promise is, His spirit will always be with me. Well, why do I need the spirit? Because I'm not good at doing all those things by myself. And and that companionship of um, helping comes through the spirit who is the messenger of grace, right? He's going to allow that transformation to take place in me. And we read about that in Romans 8, right? In great detail what, what that relationship looks like. And so for me, that's, um, that's what I think. It's just each of those sacraments or each of those ordinances, each of those entering into deeper relationship is just making me a better disciple through those holy rituals, but it's also deepening my relationship with him. And it's just a process of deepening relationship. That's what's happening there. And I feel like this goes back to what we were talking about with your book, that we, we stay in a place of humility, mm. and it's by grace that I can do these things and that I do do the, those things. And then it goes back to what it means to, to rest in Jesus mm. 
and I'm, I'm resting in the knowledge that he has saved me and that he is working in me. And then these things are a fruit of, yes. of what yes, that's my relationship such a good with Christ. Description. That is such a good description of, and we would say the same. Well, I know uh, we at least want to give you a little bit of time, Jill, to talk about Multiply Goodness and Emily and interact with that. So thank you for this good conversation. I just wanted to say that I think what we've modeled here for both a Latter-day Saint person listening to this podcast right now and to an evangelical is that the conversation had a beginning, a middle and an end. We've just wrapped it up. And in the process of dialoguing and having conversation, we got greater and greater nuanced as we talked, as we went through the journey of conversation, um, and if I would have, if I would have thought that you believe something, you know, and 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 didn't feel like you were being sincere and dismissed you in the first five minutes because, well, <laughs> that's not what Latter Day Saints really believe. Uh, I would have never got to the end of the conversation, and and we probably do end in a place that's different, um, frankly, a little bit. And you you made that distinguish. That's that's the rub you called it. That's a good word. Um, so but the conversation though has made us richer and I, I want to just encourage our listeners to say, Hey, if you have a Latter-day Saint friend or an evangelical friend, just do what you heard us do and your friendship will grow deeper and be more significant. You'll better understand each other. You'll respect each other. You'll still love each other. And as the person that the traditional Christian, you know, just found that your heart and your words were so compelling that she was going to figure out a way to get you in heaven. You know, you're, I don't know how it's going to work, but you're, you're getting in somehow, some way, you know? So, um, I think that's just, uh, you know, I know that is, we are, we are not saved by works, but you know what we are also not saved by is perfect theology. Because mm. if anybody thinks they have a perfect theology, we like to say in our dialogue groups, how much bad theology can you embrace and still be saved? You know, yeah. none of us are perfect in every way that we think about God. If we thought, if we were perfect, guess what? We'd probably be God because we'd have the mind of God. But there's got to be something that I probably am wrong about. I mean, I'll be humble enough to say that, right? And and you're probably wrong about at least one thing in your understanding of God. And you're going to get to heaven and God's going to say, well, actually, it wasn't that. It was yeah, this. I can't and wait for that day. Okay. I think that is going to be more true than we realize. where he was like, you, you did pretty good here. Let me tell you what I was trying to tell you about. <laughs> I think that's right. going to happen. So, so if we're if we're not saved by perfect theology, if it has if people want to say, well, if you believe perfectly, then you can go to heaven, or if you do all the right things, you can go to heaven. Yeah, I'm going to say that both those arguments are faulty and not uh, biblical. But I will say you can have some bad theology, and you can you can not be perfect, but through the grace of God, mm. through the mercy and kindness of God, through demonstrated through His Son Jesus Christ, and and received through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, he he is the one that does the saving and he's the one that does the changing and he's yeah. the one that does it all. And we get to give him all glory and praise and honor and uh, and just, you know, get to be thrilled that he's loved us enough to save us from our sins, but also to help us become more and more like him and and have the deepest in your in your words, the deepest possible relationship we can with God. And uh, and that will be an eternal relationship in a place called the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think I love what you were talking about with watching how the conversation went. And long ago, I learned three rules of thumb that I try and stick by with every conversation I have with anyone from any religion. And the first rule is bring only what is similar to the table. Um, I have found that to be so important is you've got to start looking for what, what do we have that is similar? And then let's learn from there together. The second rule um, is not to have any agenda for the conversation than to love each other better by the end. And I think that is so important. If you, if my whole agenda is to love Jill more at the end of the conversation than I did before we started, then I'm going to ask different questions and I'm going to respond in a different voice. And I'm going to come in humble and, and wanting to learn from Jill about her religion. And my third rule is I should be better in my religion from learning something from yours. And if yeah. those are my three rules, then um, the conversations just tend to be beautiful. And uh, Jill will recognize those rules too because those are rules that we implement in the 
faith community that we both work in together that's called Multiply Goodness. Those are the three rules that we adhere to in every conversation that we have. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about Multiply Goodness, what it is and what we do. Yeah, I want to just address your third one. You said um, that we would be deeper in our own religion. And I would love to see that changed a little bit to say that we want to be deeper in our relationship with Christ. Mm, That's so good. I love that. And one of the things that you and I talked about one time when we had breakfast together, and I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, is, is kind of there is a bridge between you and I as we're building our friendship and both of us love Christ, and um, I remember just drawing on the napkin, Mm -hmm. putting Christ in the center of that bridge, and as we have our conversations with each other to really help each other draw closer and closer to Christ, and you're coming from a very different perspective, Mm -hmm. and I'm coming from a different perspective, and like Greg said, we don't have our theology perfect, and so helping each other draw close to Christ. Yeah, I love that. That's so good. So I would love to hear from you, and I'll talk about a little bit and Multiply Goodness, um, but if you could, as we wrap up here, talk about why you started Multiply Goodness and um, maybe some background, some of your hopes for, for yeah. Multiply Goodness. So um, in those early years when I was reaching out to some Bible study groups and making friends with some traditional Christians, both here and across the whole United States, one of the women I met, was named Nish Wyzeth. And her and I sat down for a lunch one day and started talking. And um, I didn't have any really deep friendships with traditional Christians. And she didn't have any deep friendships with Latter-day Saints. And so it was a really interesting lunch because both of us were like, well, what do you believe about this? And what do you believe about this? And what was supposed to be 45 minutes ended being two and a half hours. And as we had the conversation, we both were better for it when we left. And it started this fun conversation between us where we would text back and forth or call and be like, okay, what does your religion think about this? And uh, we would have a ton of conversations like that. Well, then people started hearing we were having these conversations and couldn't believe we were friends. Hmm. And they were like, how can you dive so deeply into baptism into sacraments into grace into all of these i mean we were deep diving into these conversations and still had very great respect for one another and and people started asking how are you doing that like Mm. why is that working and so we started these little groups where we would get together and bring women together and sit at round tables And we had our three rules that I told you, and we would say them at the very beginning. And then we would read a chapter of scripture together and discuss it with those three rules in mind. And we started having these beautiful interfaith conversations. And it wouldn't be just any scripture. It was just the Bible because that's what you had in common. Yeah. Oh, you can only bring what you have in common. So that's the rule. You can pick up everything you believe when you walk out the door, but when you come to the table... You only get to bring what is similar between us. And the conversations were beautiful, and, um, and they started growing. And so we ended up um, naming that community Multiply Goodness, just an effort to bring more goodness to the world that we live in by combining together in what we found similar and helping that to grow and flourish. And now... Um, that is a community that is worldwide. We have people from all over the world who join us, and we study together three times a year and gather once a year to come together, both Latter-day Saints and traditional Christian women, mostly on the stage, speaking to our community. And I don't know that that happens anywhere else um, in, in quite the way that it does, other than that event that's held in Salt Lake City, Utah, really Lehigh, Utah, in August every year, the Jubilee Gathering is what we call it. And it has been a remarkable event, but so much fun to be part of. So when she talks about these Bible studies, we put out one in the spring and in the fall, and then we have an Advent one that we do, and Emily writes in that, and I write in that. Yeah, that's fun. Tell about the writers. Tell how that is broken up. So we have three traditional Christians and three LDS and then 
we all get a section and we each write those and then we go through and and edit each other's because we want it to be all biblical and, and we um, want to make sure it it works the for vocabulary both works works yeah yeah so so there's sometimes when when some words are thrown in there and we have to clarify with each other okay what does this mean to your community this is what it means to us and we end up changing and switching around what it says, but everything that we put in there is biblical. It's from the Old Testament or the New Testament, and it's been a fascinating process, yeah. and it's helped us as writers, too, to really learn who your audience is and how it's going to affect people. And one of the most important things in the studies that we write, I think, are the questions. Yeah. Because as these women are sitting around all over the world and having these discussions together, we want there to be questions that lead them back to Christ, that lead them back to God's word, and that help their relationships be able to be enriched and encouraged yeah. and, and to keep the conversation going. And I love that. And we are so careful with the questions as we think those through, um, because what we never want to cause is division or contention. And we think about that as we craft those questions to be questions where we could come together in a similar place and and the spirit could be part of that conversation is really important to us as we go through. Yeah, so it's been amazing working with you and I've learned a ton. Um, it's it's an amazing experience. Yeah, it's been so good. And, and within that community, that um, Multiply Goodness Faith community, it's our goal to keep that as balanced as we can, both on the writing team and in the leadership group and our board, making sure that we are equally represented um, both on the Latter-day Saint side, but also on the traditional Christian side and, and Christians from all different uh, religious backgrounds join us. And I love the representation there and what we're able to learn from each other. Yeah, it's fascinating. Greg, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I just want to compliment you both and, and, and just, uh, again, try to speak to our, our, our listeners or our viewers on YouTube. And we love it when you subscribe and we love it when you uh, like things and comment on things and do the notification bell because uh, when that happens, YouTube uh, notices that and then then our podcast gets exposed to other people. So if you would do that for us, we'd be grateful. But the, what I want to say to both of you and to your team and to your leadership is that you're providing a vehicle or a platform or an opportunity or an open door, whatever you want to call it. And Jill and I literally can tell people when we're out of the state of Utah or wherever, you know, to a maybe an evangelical friend or a traditional Christian friend who has an LDS friend, we will we'll say, you know, particularly if they're women, hey, there's this amazing thing called Multiply Goodness, and you can check it out on their website, or you can go to their Facebook page, and then you can order this Bible study, and Jill's one of the authors, and, and there's a five other ladies, and, and it's balanced, and it's something that an evangelical Latter-day Saint couple friend, you know, a pairing a friendship could just really do one-on-one, -on -one, or they could get a little group in their neighborhood or in their community. And like you said, you 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 know that that's happening all over the world. And I think your your Instagram page has something like 30 plus thousand I followers. I haven't looked at it lately. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. So that's awesome. It's, it's a, it's a little bit remarkable. less than your personal one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you have a, a a little bit of a social media following following. So no, but that that is really really cool because it's a very practical thing to be involved in this. When these students come, it, it's for spring break. It, it happens in three weeks and then it goes away for another year. But you guys are doing something that has staying power and uh, continuity and and quality. The quality of these Bible studies and the booklets or books that you create with the artwork involved is really spectacular. So I just want to say to any person listening to us uh, about uh, about this dialogue that we've had with Emily is you definitely should, uh, if you're a Latter-day Saint or an evangelical lady, check out Multiply Goodness's webpage. And I don't know if we can put that on the bottom of the screen. Uh, Marco probably can figure out how to do that. And uh, and then we will uh, also um, just encourage it maybe in the in the comments below just to check it out and follow the Instagram page or the Facebook page um, because it is spectacular. I was I was I wanted to close with this, Emily. That my greatest, uh, you know, we've only been together on, on a couple occasions, but my favorite 
Emily Freeman moment is running into you in the Arizona airport, the Phoenix, Arizona airport, and you and I and, and Jill and uh, Brad were able to be whisked away in some kind of airport uh, cart or something. I don't know how we got, I don't know how we pulled that off, but the guy <laughs> said, what are you guys doing in Phoenix or what are you doing here in Phoenix? And you said, we're here to talk about Jesus. And it was just such a beautiful, innocent, honest, enthusiastic, you know, it, it didn't, it, 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 it was, it was the comment that a, a true follower of Jesus would make, you know, just somebody who wants to talk about Jesus. And it wasn't, we're here to talk about the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or we're here to, you know, push our particular religion. It just was a very precious, uh, inspiring moment. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And I do have, and Jill, Jill knows this. I have a huge opportunity for you guys. There are two young Latter-day Saint girls. You, you know Gary Little, don't you, at the Orem Institute? Yeah. Okay. His two daughters, we just had them sing at one of our dialogues because they sing that song, uh, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. Do you know that song on Caleb? Yeah. It's awesome. And these two Latter-day Saint girls, 16 and 18-year-old, I know their names, but I'll, I'll just say they're Gary's daughters. <laughs> uh, they should be singing at your next Jubilee. Oh, that's they so fun. Bring, that's a great idea. They bring all of it. They have the enthusiasm. And and I actually shared their video with my 16-year-old daughter, evangelical daughter, and and uh, she thought they were evangelicals. <laughs> that's so I said, We should put a link to that funny? from this um, so people can easily find it. That would be so fun. That that's a good idea. That's great. Idea. So, anyways, uh, I'm I'm actually I told Gary the other day I'm, I'm going to begin to be their manager because I think they're, <laughs> they're they are absolutely incredible. And they're not just singing a cool song; they are very very talented. Their voices are they blend and they're beautiful and they have enthusiasm and passion. And and I know we have a mutual friend in Brad Pello as well. And yeah. he, he is a lover of of contemporary Christian worship music, and I know you love it. And yeah. you encourage the ladies at at the uh, Jubilee to stand up and. Even lift worship. a hand if they want. Yeah, but let's <laughs> let's worship together. There's nothing like worshiping together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. And wrapping up uh, again, please check us uh, out month to month on Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. We are so honored, Emily, that you joined us for this conversation, and we hope that it's been beneficial to people who are listening in. And and as they pass it along, um, uh, may may we just be a, a force for good and helping people have honest conversations about things that might be different, but as a result of having those conversations, we can uh, you know, just be enriched and have deeper friendship and more love for one another. So uh, Jill, do you wanna say anything to wrap it up or do you want me That's to just wrap it up? great, right? Emily. Thanks Thank so much for being a part of this. Yeah, I loved being here. Thanks for inviting me. All right, God bless. And we'll see you next time yep. on Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. <laughs>